using genomic selection in the commercial herd here at Struan. Again, relatively early days, but just wanted to give you an update on some of the results that we're seeing there. So I guess if we look at genomics, it, it you know refers to measurement of the gene structure and well gene expression within an animal and, and through years and years of research we know that certain genes are associated with certain production traits and we're able to predict that if an animal has certain genes expressed that they have a greater predisposition for certain traits, be they good or bad. So we have the ability to predict things like coat colour and whether an animal is horned or polled or whether it's dominant or recessive for that. Um, but more so now the production traits around carcass marbling, growth rate, uh, milk production, things like that. The, the, the measurement of that of the genomic potential of an animal, their actual gene expression is certainly an area which has developed considerably over the last 30 years. Um, but realistically, we've got, you know, this, this group of steers down here in the bottom with the red arrow above them, they're, they're a combination of the genetics, that, that gene expression that I said, and also the environment that we place them in. And, and the variation that we might see in that group of animals down the bottom is, is a function of those two. Now, we have control over the environment um, and we, we're trying to sculpt that to get the best out of the animals as much as we can. But I guess the question remains, what there is always inherent variation in the genetics within a group of animals and as much as we, we go out and we select bulls, particularly, like I'll just keep it in a cattle context, we select bulls on, on genetic merit, doesn't mean every single animal that they produce is, is equally as good, if not better, than them. So there's still that variation there. And how do we select that in a commercial herd? Typically, genomics selection has only been available in the seed stock industry because it's relied on a heavy amount of measurement of the animals and their actual physical performance. So we can look at the gene expression, but also have to follow them through and look at growth rate, look at progeny performance and things like that as well to actually start to build what we call an estimated breeding value up for them. But there's been some advances in, in, tech, in technology and also some of the databases now in, in terms of the amount of genetic information that we have on animals, um, whereby we can actually measure genetic variation in a commercial herd of animals. We don't necessarily need to measure them as intensively and we can actually rank them on their merit for a range of production traits. And this is, this is a commercial offering that's been brought to the industry by uh, Neogen Australasia, which are, well, they're an American company, but this is, um, they're an Australian arm, is the, the Australasian arm. And we've been working with them to, to bring this out um, and, and drive it out to industry. And, and the Struan site here is a key, key demonstration of that. So what it actually means is we can get a, a group of those animals, be they steers or heifers, but let's focus on replacement heifers, take a small tissue sample and test them, get their gene expression and rank them on, on their genetic merit at a young age to give us an indication of those superior animals before they express it. Um, so when we get into a situation where we need to select the highest potential individuals if times get tough and we need to make harsh selection decisions or we really want to put a lot of selection pressure on our herd, then we can make those decisions earlier. So what we're saying is it really does enable you to increase the accuracy of replacement heifer selection because when you come to weaning it might be you know, a big shiny heifer at the front of the mob. She might have been the first born early in the calving season doesn't necessarily mean she's genetically the best. Without any other information, we're always going to pick her and put, put maximal resources to her. Does it really mean she's the best? Because of the range of traits that are there, we can actually create selection indexes based on multiple traits and ta tailor them to the individual production system and your goals. Um, and, and by building a picture of the genetic merit of the cow herd, the commercial cow herd, um, we can start to see where, we're, where we are genuinely strong or weak in, in certain traits and tailor bull purchasing decisions based off that. Um, and for some people, you can use it as a commercial in-herd bull selection tool. So the other point that's 
probably I, I didn't touch on here is that this, this particular offering is underpinned by a database with multiple breeds within it and that enables us to deal with crossbred animals um, and that is a major point of difference in that we're not stuck within a breed type. Um, so yeah, within Angus, Red Angus, Limousin, Shorthorn, Main Anjou, Gelvy, I know they're a bit more on the rarer side. Um, and Simmental, there's a, any combination of those breeds currently we can deal with, with this, within this data set. Um, and that, that's really great because there are a lot of comp composite herds coming out and the ability to select those animals is, is huge. So I guess in terms of the traits that we measure are akin to many of the traits that you would see when you go and purchase bulls um, on EBVs in, in that you've got your maternal traits around birth weight, calving ease, milk production, heifer conception probability, docility and also the herd longevity. We've got performance traits which are largely around growth and feed efficiency and then the carcass traits, so our end product traits around carcass weight, fatness, intramuscular fat, marbling, um, and even tenderness. So we all, simply we take a, a tissue sample off each individual animal and that's allocated against that animal's uh, farm management and uh, RFID or EID tag. And they're taken into an all flex tissue sampling unit. That's a very small ear punch. And we can take that, you could take it at birth, you could take it at a, as early as you like. We took it um, at marking. So, in the strewing context, the first year of animals that we've sampled, there's 153 steers and heifers from last year's drop that were tested. And um, the results that come back through through the Neogen database come in a in CSV form, but also in in a in a graphical form. Basically, to give you an idea, each of these graphs represents a trait. So let, this is carcass weight. These are the indi these are the rankings one to ten. So each trait is ranked one to ten. Each animal will get a score one to ten. And it's the dis this is the distribution of the group in the columns. So in this instance, nearly 30% of the 150 animals that we tested had a had a score of an identity score of six for carcass weight. And so this is the population distribution, the number of animals throughout. The green line is the reference herd, which is actually the mother database that all the calculations are done against. And that's that's uh, 26 odd million records now. Um, International Genetic Solutions database out of the US, so that's that's got a significant amount of power in it. Um, but over time, if we're measuring within your herd, uh, you can use your own herd's historical data as a reference, so we can start to see changes in the trend in trait. So if something like a carcass weight, if you're really trying to push selection on carcass weight, we actually want higher ranked animals, and we'll push it up this way and you'll see how, how your performance has changed over time relative to your reference, but you obviously need multiple groups of animals through to have a reference database there. So I guess what, what do the numbers mean? Because each trade is ranked one to 10. So, you know, people ask that question, what, what does it mean? And just to give you a couple of examples here, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll just focus on the weaning weight example here. We've got two animals, two different scores. So one animal's scored a nine, the others scored a three. The average of the group is five and a half. What that actually means, the, the additional yearling weight that we would expect from those animals for the, the, the animal that scored nine, we would expect a 14.42 kilo increase in yearling weight over a score one. And if for the th score three animal, it would be a 3.58 kilo yearling weight. So there's a nearly 11 kilo difference in, in weaning weight between these two animals um, based on their score. If we're looking at a group of animals and they're both two little calves or two little weaners and, and we need to make a decision who to keep, if we can identify particularly that three and keep them out, then you know we put the feed resources into growing them out. Um, why, why not put the feed resources into the proportion of the herd that actually have the genetic merit to perform as quickly and efficiently as possible? So, you know, that 10.84 kilo difference between those two animals sort of equates to a 
using five dollars fifty now. I know the cattle market's hot, and I've just picked a mid-range figure. So don't, um, you know, we start to see a sort of sixty dollar sixty dollar difference between those two animals just in weaning weight alone. Now we've got sixteen, fifteen other different traits that we're reporting on as well. So pick your value as it goes there. Um, I won't go through the residual feed intake example, but I'm happy to go through that with anyone at a later date as well. So, so far what we've seen in terms of the animals that's drawn, I've just focused on yearling weight because we only recently have, have taken that weight off those animals. Um, so that's all I can report on now because they haven't been mated. They obviously haven't got calves on the ground, so I can't look at performance of those calves. But basically we've got a range of three to eight yearling weight. What I've done is grouped up out of that 150 animals, the average, the average weight of each animal that scored a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, eight, and a nine. And what we actually see is that the three score was, were considerably lower. There wasn't a tremendous amount of difference in the four, five, and six score animals in terms of their average weight currently at a yearling weight, but those higher scored animals were, were considerably higher, um, sort of 20, 20 to 40 kilos higher. But basically for every single point score that we saw increase, um, about a 14.7 uh, 14 .7 kilo increase in yearling weight. So if we can shift that average from 5.9 to 6.9 over 150 animals, that starts to, over time, that starts to add up into a considerable amount of, of, of gain. Pricing wise, what does this look like? It's about $42 for the the test as is, you can add parentage verification if you have information on the on the parents and identify who the actual mother is and, and the father if you're using multiple bulls. There's also the ability to add on a bovine viral diarrhea virus test or a pestivirus test as well as per there and can package them up. So relatively speaking, the cost is especially in the cattle price now, um, if you're testing a group of animals now and, and able to select those that are going to stay in your herd longer and be higher performing, um, it's relatively easy to write that sort of those sort of figures off. Um, and I'll, I can go through some, some sort of bigger level herd figures around what that looks like and the returns there with you if you're interested. But yeah, so in closing, these, these new commercial genomic technologies enable us to increase the accuracy of, of our overall genetic selection, but particularly those replacement heifers, really, really, really push the genetic progress in our herd overall. Make sure that we're picking the right bulls and track our progress and genetic progress actually in the herd over time. Um, certainly some future opportunities that we're seeing coming out internationally around being able to market cattle based on these testing results and, and, and pushing a premium product based on them being the top percentage of your herd that you might be marketing and certainly even testing feeder steers and looking at their ability to um, perform uh, particularly in longer fed programs where we're looking at chasing high quality carcasses so making sure that we've got high feed efficiency, high marbling genetics um, that are going to actually perform when we put the resources into them. So thank you.